Greetings, and welcome to Cybersecurity Today. I'm Jim Wiggins, your guide through the interesting world of cybersecurity. For those tuning in for the first time, allow me to provide a brief introduction to our program. This program delves deep into the complexities of cybersecurity. Leveraging my comprehensive background in the field, I'm here to offer insightful and compelling discussions on a variety of computer security topics. Our 30-minute episodes adopt a format reminiscent of a talk show or a news segment covering a broad spectrum of themes, issues, and the latest developments in cybersecurity. Tailored for an audience that ranges from novices to experts in the field, our show brings critical insights and perspectives from leading cyber professionals on the forefront in terms of trends of the cybersecurity landscape. Our mission is to cater to a diverse viewership, whether you're just starting out or you're a seasoned expert. We trust you'll find today's installment both informative and engaging. Typically, our program is divided into two distinct segments. The first part, we call it Cyberbytes, and this focuses on a variety of current events and issues and trends that are currently shaping the cybersecurity industry. Then in our next segment, we're thrilled to welcome Ms. Erica Carrera, the Vice President and Chief Information Security Officer at Wabtech. She will delve into Wabtech's dedicated efforts towards strategies for strengthening cyber resilience in global enterprises, focusing on enhancing the cybersecurity framework and preparing professionals to effectively safeguard information systems against emergency threats. All right, let's delve into the CyberVite segment and uncover the most recent developments today in the cybersecurity world. In current news, the United States is facing an imminent threat from China's advanced cyber capabilities, targeting critical US infrastructure within the next three years, necessitating a strategic overhaul in the cybersecurity response. This threat, underscored by China's potential military ambitions concerning Taiwan, extends beyond military systems to crucial lifeline sectors such as energy, transportation, water, and communications, as outlined by the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA. Recent actions, including the FBI's disruption of the Chinese hacking operations Volt Typhoon, highlight the tangible nature of these threats. Yet current policy debates and reforms are deemed insufficient against the scale of the threat, a radical shift towards preparing for such a mitigation, uh, mitigating such cyber actions and attacks akin to natural disaster responses involving rigorous training, mutual aid agreements, and substantial government funding for cybersecurity initiatives is imperative to safeguard national security. In other news, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, has outlined its strategic cybersecurity initiatives for 2024, focusing on enhancing national cyber defenses through the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative, or JCDC. Established in 2021, the JCDC has played a pivotal role in fortifying cybersecurity measures, particularly in critical areas like open source software and water management incident response. For 2024, CISA aims to deepen industry government cooperation and tackle emergency cyber threats across three main areas, combating advanced persistent threats, boasting the cybersecurity framework for vital infrastructure, and three, staying ahead of risks posed by new technologies. Key priorities include defending against state-sponsored cyber threats, particularly from China, preparing for significant cyber incidents, ensuring election security, combating ransomware, advocating for secure by design principles, and addressing challenges posed by artificial intelligence. CISA's commitment to collaborative efforts underscores the ongoing endeavor to secure the nation's cyber frontier against evolving threats. That covers some of the major headlines making an impact today. We're gonna to pause briefly and return with our guest, Ms. Erica Carrera, to explore Wabtec's role in advancing cybersecurity resilience across the global enterprises. Stick around and we'll reconnect right after the break. 
VA's round-the-clock hotline can put veterans who are homeless in touch with the resources and support they earned through their military service. Call 877-424-3838. Welcome back to Cybersecurity Today. Joining us now is Ms. Erica Carrera, Vice President and Chief Information Security Officer at Wabtec, a Fortune 500 company operating across 53 countries. Erica boasts over two decades of experience in information technology and cybersecurity, spearheading initiatives to navigate cyber risks, data governance, and digital transformation. With a profound experience in security governance, compliance, privacy, and digital systemic risk, she has significantly enhanced Wabtec's security posture and compliance maturity. Today, she's here to share her strategies on strengthening cyber resilience in global enterprises focusing on the integration of robust security measures to bolter different types of security operations and even help out with brand reputation in the face of evolving cyber threats. Erica, welcome to the show. Wow, what an introduction. Thank you, Jim. Um, pleasure to be here today. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I usually like to have guests maybe just provide a little bit of a background and I thought maybe what you could do is share a little bit about your journey to becoming a CISO and how it shaped your approach to being in cybersecurity leadership today. Any thoughts on that? I have plenty of thoughts on that. Uh, I have a very non-traditional path to this seat, and I, I talk about it often to inspire people that would otherwise think cybersecurity isn't in their future. I think if you talk to any CISO or any senior director level um, security practitioner, these days, we all came from a non-traditional path. I mean, for instance, my, my bachelor's degree is in history. And I got my bachelor's degree while I was on active duty as a military police officer in the US Army. So I have a passion for physical security. And when I got out of the Army, I went and I worked for the DOD on a contract. Um, and I was at the lowest level of IT that you can think of. I was a data input operator, data. Uh, Data, data input level five, something like that. And um, on that same contract within six months, I applied to be a help desk position and then a system administrator after that, system engineer, and then a system analyst. And around the time I was doing uh, AUP violations, acceptable use violation investigations, I caught the attention of the, the um, government service side and they asked me if I would come and work to build out a, a NOC a network operations center for a network where we tested our weapon systems and every country friendly to us tested their weapon systems. So I built out the network and the server side, no separation of duty back then. Um, and then that network needed to be certified to connect to the DOD backbone. And that was around the time that there, it was DIACAP before NIST RMF came around and so they said, who better to certify this from a security perspective than somebody that played a part in building both sides of it. So um, I got my information assurance certifications and um, worked to get an ATO to get that um, connected to the DOD backbone. That was successful. And then I built out a red knock and um, uh, went from there. So I have a, a very strong background in IT and a passion for security. And it just led me to keep pursuing roles to build and grow and, 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 and get into people leadership. And that's really where the secret sauce is. If you have a passion for people and you know how to make them feel like they belong, then you're gonna get the best out of them and build some really strong teams, really strong, resilient teams. Understood, understood. Uh, you know, maybe building on top of that, I'd like to get into talk a little bit about how you go about then trying to build a culture around cybersecurity and maybe some of the processes that you have developed or that you have implemented to help kind of facilitate that. It seems like that's a nice segue into that next question. That is nice. Uh, so I come from a highly regulatory background where you have requirements. Part of your job in the defense industrial base or the DOD is to think secure, live secure, be secure, know how to um, label that document. And then I come over to the manufacturing space and 
you don't have the regulatory hammer to use anymore. So I really had to rely on my soft skills and my, my, my passion for people, like I said before, and build relationships and understand what people do for the company, what they do to generate revenue, what they do to, to keep, um, the company relevant and, um, make customers happy. So I, I had to learn, um, how to build a brand around that in, in, in a vacuum where there was no regulatory space to say, you have to do this securely. So, um, at Wabtech, it was getting to know the business, getting to know the P and L leaders and understanding the terminology they used, developing a, a common lexicon. And, and that for me was safety here. We tout our safety record. And um, people understand the concept of stop, think, act, right, from a safety perspective. So I applied that to security. And we've really driven a very strong program to have good results from a, the perspective of driving down user-initiated uh, events or incidences that we're investigating. And that's all due to... Um, building out a really secure um, security awareness program that takes the people into account. Um, so I don't use canned out of the box security awareness training. It's uh, all developed by a production company inside of Wabtech. Understood, understood. <laughs> so I, I, I'm curious, I, that makes a lot of sense. I, I'd like to kind of maybe shift a little bit and expand upon, you know, Web, Webtech's got a pretty interesting presence. They're not just only located here in the US. Um, they've got an overseas presence, I know. Uh, we've talked about that uh, offline. And I'm curious, how are you managing and navigating the complex global set of regulations and privacy laws and, and, and maintaining sanity. Can, can you speak to that for a little bit? I'm, you know, anyway, so if you, could, if you could address that, that'd be great. Thank you for thinking I'm sane. <laughs> 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 so I traveled um, to Europe last year and got some really good feedback from a lot of executive level people on the need to align with the business a little better. Um, and from that feedback, I came back to the United States and, and really thought about it. And I came up with building a business information security office in my team and have regional representation. That way the business is getting what they need from us from the perspective of they have a point of contact, they have a face, um, they know who to ask whenever there's a cyber information security issue um, that needs to be addressed. But also what that does for me is it gives me people in region that stay on top of net new and changing regulatory space, but also we sign contracts with customers in different countries and there's different requirements. So from a legal, regulatory, statutory, and contractual um, space, I have representation and the expectation is those people stay on top of that and bubble that up to me. But we also built out a database so that anybody can look at that and we can perform gap analysis against changing and net new requirements. And then we can prioritize those and talk to the business to say, hey, we need to address these gaps um, so that we can keep out of trouble, whatever trouble that is. So do you then have kind of custom control requirements that are unique to each market? Or do you have kind of a universal one size fits all approach? Really try to do a unified type of framework, because if you look at all of these requirements, you can, the lowest common denominator, you're going to see the same across the space, no matter where you're looking. So the new TSA requirement for critical infrastructure or the new NIST 2 in the European Union. If you're talking about MFA, you're talking about MFA. So then you have to look at what's adequate protection if you're using the example of MFA. Um, so, right, I like the concept and the efficiency in, in a unified framework so that you're assessing once and applying to the many. Understood, understood. Um, so that then leads us into a discussion around maybe training and, uh, 
you talked a little bit about that already, but you know, do you then have different kinds of training programs for different roles in different locations? Or again, is that also kind of a unified approach? Can you speak to that for a minute? Right now, where we're at is there's two, two types of training, three technically, but two um, in my space where I am responsible. Now we have role-based training specifically for engineers. And then in the enterprise space, I have security training for all of the organization to include the board of directors and that's the annual security awareness training and then we have targeted training for groups of people that have different roles in the organization um and then the third is is fishing of course so i would like to say that on the scale of maturity to one to five i think we're a 2.5 there um but I like to build in continual improvement into everything we do. So it's it's a process. Um, we have a good structure around pulling factory floor out of those statistics and making sure that I have representation going to each of the factories to align with either a quality day or a safety day to ensure that we're giving our security awareness training to everybody. So it, it is a phased approach. It is a program that I'm, I'm coming up on my third year in Wabtech, and it's a five-year program. So, yes, it's in the plan, um, and can we we can always do better. So, with that being said, how are you then measuring effectiveness of the the training plan and the awareness initiatives? Do you collect metrics? Do you look for reported incidents? What kind, of, what kind of indicators do you guys look to to say, hey, our, our training program is having the kind of desired effect? That's exactly right. So there's two types of metrics that we use here, effectiveness and coverage. Coverage is the number of people that are completing the training or the number of people that are completing, passing successfully or not clicking on the fish. The other metric is effectiveness, and that's that's really where the proof is. Are we doing good um, in our in our campaigns? And that's a uh, number of user initiated events that we have to investigate that are you know positives. Um, so that's that's one of the key performance indicators we use. And um, I can tell you we are getting better at that. And then we use the types of incidences that we see to generate new phishing campaigns, or um, we include them in the security awareness campaigns, or we kick off individual targeted campaigns. So, you know, business email compromise is huge. So if we have an incident around that, and we're, I would like to just emphasize how good we are at containing incidences, um, give a shout out to my incident response team. They are really good at what they do. So we like to use the after action review reports to shore up our security awareness training um, modules. Understood, understood. Um, I'd like to now kind of move away from training and talk a little bit about enterprise preparation. I think you're in an interesting space given you know, the footprint that Wabtec has. Any guidance or any thoughts on how global enterprises should be preparing for the evolving cyber threat landscape? Like, what do you guys do? Obviously, you probably stay current on what's happening in the, in the world, but I didn't know if there were any kind of best practices or things you guys are doing to help prepare or that other people might learn from. There is a, a SANS white paper on using the COIN doctrine to enhance your cybersecurity policies. And I think that is a really worthy paper that was published, I think in 2017, but still relevant today. And the premise with COIN in regards to um, cybersecurity, and that's the enemy can be anywhere. So if you're operating from the perspective that the enemy can be anywhere, then you're training people to think that way. You're training people from a military type of perspective to be ready whenever something happens. And to do that, you have to train. You have to train and train and train so that when something happens, it's muscle memory to respond to it. You, you react the way you are trained. And that's, that's what you need to do. You need to hire people that are talented, um, that are adaptable, and you need to give them the equipment 
to do what they need to do, adequate equipment, and you need to train them on that equipment. And you, you think you're training enough, train a little more because everybody is going to have some kind of incident. How quickly you respond and contain it and learn from it is going to make all the difference. Um, with the changing threat landscape, um, what I've seen so far, the best thing you can do, and I'm going to pay homage to Earl Newsom over at Cummins, he says two legs and two wires. You need to protect those. You need to spend the time to teach people basic cyber hygiene, and you need to take the time to do the basics, the CIS level one. You need to know what you have. You need to know who has access to it, right? Um, uh, sorry, asset management, access control. Um, you need to do the things that people just want to skip over. You need to shut down unused ports, um, protocols and services. You need to change the um, default password on your appliances that come into your network. You, If you're not putting in processes that keep your data secure, you're going to fail. So that new vendor needs to go through third-party risk management. That new hardware needs to go through hardware approval. That new software needs to go through software security assessment. You need to do these things and you need to have a, a, an adequate and robust program to ensure that you're securing those things that are coming and connecting to your devices or have access to your network. It's funny, as you mentioned that, I think about the adage of it's always about the fundamentals, right? We always want to yes. over, you know, go, go, we don't want to focus on the fundamentals. We want to go for the fun stuff. And, you know, whether you're studying for a sport or you're learning how to play the piano or whatever it happens to be, it's always the fundamentals that we, we really need to master. And I think that's what I, I, I hear you say. Is, is that a fair way to characterize it, would you say? <laughs> that's exactly how I say it here, yes. Focus on the fundamentals. Exactly. Now, in terms of uh, some of these practices that you were talking about, do you guys get involved in any kind of exercises? I mean, you talked earlier about some phishing campaigns, but I'm wondering in order to kind of elevate that uh, knowledge and skill and capability, do, are there other activities that you guys get involved with to help kind of make sure people know what to look for? Like tabletop exercises? Exactly, yeah. Yes, yes, uh, that is part of the culture here in my organization. Tabletop exercises aren't uh, uh, an afterthought. They are baked into like 2024 objectives, 2023 objectives. They are part of people's performance evaluations in my organization. It is an expectation from my perspective that we do this and we include cross-functionality. Everybody that could have a part in it, anywhere that it could, um, uh, it, it, the initial infection vector could happen. Everybody needs to know that they have a part in this, even if it's if it's minute. And the more visibility you give into what you're doing, um, the better people understand the security organization in their company. I don't think it should be this obscure organization that people are like, mm, I don't know what they do. <laughs> right? Yep, yep. Understood. All right. So uh, next question I want to talk about. Let's look into. Let's look. Let's talk about the future, right? Let's let's look into our crystal ball. Any thoughts on how organizations can balance innovation and security as they plan for the future? One example could be like artificial intelligence. Everybody is now talking about machine learning and how we use it. How do you find that right balance, especially at a at global scale for an organization that's around the world? Any any thoughts on how you guys are? Uh, you know, trying to to, 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 to to string that thread? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just going to keep banging the same drum. And, and this is what I have spoken about and, and worked towards at this organization. AI technology, machine learning needs to be treated like any other technology that's going to come into this organization, connect to the network, have access to data. We need to be able to control it. it. It needs to go through the same rigor and assessment that everything else does uh, to include the manufacturer of that technology. And then there needs to be strong governance around the use of it. And if you talk about the AI, machine learning, large language models, whatever it is, there needs to be gates for human interaction that, that the 
the, the technology can't work unsupervised from a human perspective. And, and then the, the big thing I'm seeing right now as a problem is um, rogue AI or shadow AI because people want to use these clients or software that have AI generation built into it. And, and that's something that is going to get harder and harder to, to capture and, and make sure that it goes through the legal process for the end user licensing agreement. What does it actually do? Where does it actually store our, our web tech information or our customer information? So um, we really need to be using a, a very strong microscope on technology to make sure that we understand what it does and what it leverages to do what it does and then what it where it sends our data. Oh, that makes sense, that makes a lot of sense. Hey Erica, we're running low on time. Um, can How can the viewers learn more about you? I mean, it's been a great interview, appreciate you coming on the show, but if someone wanted to reach out to you, how, how could they connect with you? I am on LinkedIn and I guess my handle, if you call it that, is Digitally Savvy Cyber. And I'm also on X, formerly Twitter, and I am Wabtex CISO. So Wabtex CISO on X, if anybody wants to get a hold of me. Awesome. All right, Erica, we are out of time. Thank you for joining us and providing such valuable insights to our viewers. We deeply appreciate you sharing your time with us. I appreciate being on the show. Thank you again, Jim. It's always good to see you. So thanks again, Erica. Hey, guys and gals, that's going to conclude today's episode. Again, a quick shout out and thank you to Eric Carrera for joining us and sharing her vast knowledge on enhancing cyber resilience within global corporations, spotlighting Wabtech's strategic initiatives and some of their practices. We trust today's discussion has been both illuminating and engaging, offering new insight into cybersecurity strategies. For further details about cybersecurity today and follow up on upcoming episodes, we invite you to visit our show's website at www.cybersecuritytoday.org. Additionally, you can scan the QR code that's displayed at the bottom of your screen for quick and easy access to the show's website. Finally, we welcome your questions or comments via email at contactus at cybersecuritytoday.org. Feel free to reach out to us. We look forward to seeing you at our next broadcast. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day. Stay safe, stay informed. <laughs>